Life sometimes come at you fast. Tragedies make your life unravel. You feel like you wanna give up and stay locked down. Even when your heart is shattered, you still got a life to live. You still got a life to live, so don't give up. We are beautiful miracles. We are beautiful miracles. We are beautiful miracles. So don't. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me again on my podcast, My Beautiful Tragedy. If you like what you're hearing, would you please subscribe, like, comment, and share? We want to get this information out to as many people as possible. Today, I have a very special guest, and his name is Dion Walker Sr., and he is the father of Matthew Walker, who is a four-time cancer survivor, and he has also had three bone marrow transplants. I've been following his story for quite some time, and I've been very invested in how Matthew's doing, and I wanted to speak with Dion because he is a fierce advocate, and he's a big numbers guy, and I feel like those statistics can really drive the point home. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dion. Oh, no, thank you. The pleasure's all mine. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that, you know, is important to me with my podcast is to raise awareness about childhood cancer and how underfunded and under-researched it is. So would you talk to us a little bit? Tell us your story. Tell us about your family and about Matthew and his journey. Yes, um, Matthew is 18 years old, and as Kerry said, he's had cancer four times since um, in the past six years, actually. Uh, he was first diagnosed in 2015 with ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Did well with that, went to remission fairly quickly, and then he relapsed with ALL in 2016, which led to a bone, his, bone, uh, his first bone marrow transplant in 2017. We got through that. Uh, he was cancer-free, doing well. And then in 2019, he was diagnosed with a new cancer called MPAL, known as mixed phenotype acute leukemia, which is basically basically is AML and ALL together. You sort of got both in wow. layman terms. Yeah, um, and that's a very rare. You're going to hear, we talk rare, it's Matthew. Everything rare happens to Matthew. But that is a very rare cancer with a very low survival rate. And um, he beat it. He, he, he got into a couple of clinical trials and he beat it hands down. Wow. We had a bone marrow transplant after that and he was fine. And then in uh, last year in 2020, August, he was diagnosed for the fourth time with AML, which is acute myeloid leukemia. And it sort of stunned his doctors because they said it's very rare, is that word again, it's very rare to have, be diagnosed with AML if you had MPAL first. They said it's kind of rare. But it made his doctor, for lack of a better word, happy because when she came in and told us it was AML, she was smiling. She's like, I'm I got good news. It's AML. Oh, gosh. We're like, yeah, like that's good news. Yeah. Cause they were expecting it to be impal again. They thought he may relapse with impal. And if that had happened, we'd have been in serious trouble. So they were excited. Oh, I know it's weird. Excited. That was AML and that we had hope and that we had a possible treatment path. Um, he went into remission with that fairly quickly, had his bone marrow transplant last October and he's doing fine today. Wow. But he has had a lot of late effects. and Oh, yes. Those are things I just feel like either people don't know about or they don't talk about. And so share some of that with me, if you will. Oh, absolutely. Um, late-term effects is something that you hear when you, your child first has cancer. Your goal is to treat, is to treat your child, have them beat cancer and be done with it. And at the beginning, they'll tell you, okay, we're gonna give you, we're gonna give your child this chemo. We can give them this chemo. We're gonna do this radiation in hopes of getting your child to remission. But what you don't realize in the background, or what we didn't, it just glossed over is that you're basically giving our kids poison. 
Chemo is poison. Mm -hmm. Radiation is bad for your body. Uh, so they're giving you all this, your kids all this chemo, it's radiation, and then later they're like, oh, by the way, even if we get them cured and they're fine, 5, 10, 15 years down the road, because we gave them this poison, they may have a heart attack. They may develop secondary cancers. They may start having and like an organ failure or whatever. They call them late-term effects. They t that tends to happen years after treatment is over. And unfortunately for Matthew, it seems like he's been in treatment for six years. It seems like all the late-term effects hit him early. Mm. You know, I mean, early. Um, GVHD. What is that? Oh, boy. Uh, Graft-versus-host disease. So yes. talk a little bit Graf. more about what that is. Because you, yes, you, you know, right. you live in the cancer world, so you know that. And what I, what I want to do is educate as much as I can about some of those things. Oh, absolutely. Uh, GVHD is graft versus host disease. Basically, after you get a bone marrow transplant, what's happening with the bone marrow transplant is you're getting someone's immune system placed into you, their DNA. And sometimes, once their DNA is inside their bodies, their DNA wakes up and it's like, whoa. Everything in here is foreign. I got to attack it because it's an immune system, right? So the immune system wakes up. We, we call it engraftment. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's like, hey, everything in here is foreign. It goes and does its job. It starts attacking. Everything is foreign. It could be organs. It could be skin. It could be whatever. And that's what graft versus host is. is it's your donor cells attacking your body because it views it as an invader. It thinks it's still in this original the original body basically. Right. And what is and the treatment for that? Treatment for uh, GVHD is time. Um, a lot of steroids. You, you're basically treating the symptoms, but it, steroids, believe it or not, helps a lot, but you get a lot of it. And there's and, effects from that too, right? Oh yes. There's effects from steroids. You know, you take steroids for a year. We're, we're not talking small doses. We're talking heavy stuff. They can wreak havoc on you years down the road. You can start developing um, problems with your bones. You, you could, parts of your bones could start dying off, necrosis, stuff like that. So, Matthew had that too, by the oh, way. Oh, gosh. What, That's what it's we're kind of almost right like what he, what hasn't he had is what it sounds like. Yes, yes, it's like what he, yeah, because all this stuff should happen years later. But since, what I feel is since he's been in constant treatment for the past six years with a little break here, he gets like a year break here, a year and a half there, but then he's right back to getting pounded with chemo and he, all his late term effects are happening now. Um, I mean, he's even made a comment before. He's like, well, at least I'm getting it over with. I mean, it's like, <laughs> well, hopefully. Right. I know. Yeah, I, yeah. I know I've heard you mention, um, and one of the cancers that he had, how many uh, chemos that he received? Do you know that yes. number? Oh, I know that number by heart. <sighs> um, in the past six years, he's had 771 doses of chemotherapy. Oh, now, my gosh. Yeah, 771 doses of chemotherapy. And some people are like, well, what do you consider a dose? Okay, if they bring in a 300 milliliter bag, of chemo that they're going to run for 24 hours. That's a dose. Oh my God. That's a dose. If they come in and they give him a chemo pill, one chemo pill, that's a dose. Yes. Yeah. So I have from day one kept track and I mean, I can tell you, I can pull my books out and tell you the day he got it, what type it was, how much they gave him, what time it was. And then, what happened to him afterwards? What was his effects, you know, side effects? Uh, so as of today, he's had 771 doses of chemotherapy. And out of those, they used 19 different chemotherapy drugs on him in the past six years. Now, how many of those do you know were intended for children? Or were they, were they types of chemo that were intended for adults, but since they don't have a lot of treatments for children... Um, there was three that were intended for children specifically. The rest were all adults. The rest of the chemos were all intended for adults. Some dating back into the sixties. 
in the, just, the 1960s. It's just upsetting and, when you think about how you see it because you are in that hospital. You see how antiquated the treatments are and how there's been so little progress. Like, wh- why do you think that is? Um, my personal opinion, and it may upset some people, is um, there was a co- I'll back up. There was a comedian who was on TV one time. He said, the money isn't in the cure. The money's in the treatment. And it, Agreed. and it like blew my mind. I was like, Whoa, he's right. Cause then he broke it down. He said, he used an example. He's like, the United States cured polio. And I think when they cured polio, they realized how much money they lost off of the cure when the treatment was more profitable. So I don't know. That's just, that's, that's saying that's what it is. And, the adult cancer world, their 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 funding and research is, you know, more funded than child than children's. Right. And a lot of times, the new chemos that are approved for adults are that's what the pediatric world latches onto. It's like, oh, this works for an adult. Prime example for Impal, Matthew. One of the chemos Matthew was given was made for adults adults only and then someone thought that hey let's do a clinical trial and see if this chemo can help children and matthew was part of that clinical trial wow. and matthew and matthew for his type of cancer he had impal he was the they told us he was the first kid to get that chemo for that cancer wow and it worked it, i mean it worked phenomenally right but, but I, it wasn't intended for him. Right. It wasn't intended for the child. Right. And I feel like when you're trying to save your child's life, you'll probably do just about anything. Would just you about. You, you said just about anything. You came here right now and offered me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and said, this is going to work. I'm going to try it. Right. I mean, you, you'll do anything to save your, your, your child or you'll take any advice from medical professionals. They're offering you this medicine. Oh Even though God. it was made for an adult, they're like, hey, we'll give it to a child. Maybe we'll lower the dose so it doesn't affect them as bad. But are you willing to try it? We're like, yes. Yeah. We were just we looking for any answer. To to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know? my gosh. Now, do they think that um, any of the secondary cancers he got were from the treatments? Yes. Yes. So absolutely. they believe that? Yes, they believe that. Absolutely. That um, that the impal. You know, it's like that's not a relapse. That's a, that's a new cancer mm. because he he never had it before. So when I was talking to his college, they was like, "Yeah, I guess you know it's a secondary cancer, AML." He had never had AML before. Mm. That's a secondary cancer. You know, now if he used to get ALL, that's a relapse because you had oh, that cancer before. Right, but, right. It's interesting but, yeah. that it was all um, four different mm-hmm. types of leukemia. Yes. Yeah. That, that's the interesting part is he's run the gauntlet of leukemia. It's just yeah. crazy. Well, you know, um, you had shared something that really throttled me um, when you talked about your state of Kentucky being the highest occurrence of sh- pediatric cancer. And then also the county that you are from having, I think, was the highest in the state, correct? Yeah, it was the highest. Uh, when he was first diagnosed in 2015, the county, I lived in Hardin County, Kentucky, which is, which is known for Fort Knox. Fort Knox sits in Hardin County. And uh, at the time, when Matthew was first diagnosed, I started digging. Like, why is this happening to Matthew? You know, at first I blamed myself. I was in the military for 21 years. I've been overseas, you know, Desert Storm, the Iraq War, whatever. And I was thinking, did I, did I bring something back? Did I cause this? And I got to dig, and it's like, wait a minute. I'm at this hospital in Louisville and I'm starting to meet people, you know, I'm starting to meet the Roberts and I'm starting to meet, you know, Serratos and, and these people are from Hardin County or they're out from where we live. Right. And then you start talking, there's a lot of people up here from Hardin County and I started digging into, you know, in the Kentucky stuff and kind of found out at the time, Hardin County was ranked number one at the time, three years straight. It went on to hold that ranking for five years straight. They were ranked number one in the state of Kentucky for pediatric cancer cases. And without a reason, there was no reason. They didn't offer a reason. It was just, this is to, you know, you know, the stats show that we're number one for five years straight. 
with no no reason behind it. And that really got to me. Then I started looking outside and noticing that, hey, Kentucky as a state is really up there for pediatric and adult cancer. So it, I don't know the reason. Where do you get your information from? Oh, I, uh, I, I do a lot of Googling, but before people bash Googling, I, I'm not Googling like, you know, fringe things or conspiracies. I'm looking at like the nice. Kentucky state government. Right. I'm looking for um, sources that can be, that can hold up against scrutiny. Sure. You know, the, there's a lot of people in Kentucky that dedicate their lives to researching cancers across the board and that stuff gets reported up higher, you know, to the state, to the uh, NCI, the government and what's not. So that's where I get a lot of my information and, and I track their stats. Like they release it every year. It's right there. You can go to uh, state websites, state government websites, childhood cancer, right? cancer. They release their stats every year. Right. And they, and they rank the counties in Kentucky. So you can see where your county is sitting as your, you know, for the year your kid was diagnosed or five years, you know, five years ago, eight years ago, whatever. Yeah. And I think that was partially what startled me because um, I'm originally from Muscatine, Iowa, and Muscatine County was number two for the highest incidence of pediatric cancer. And to see that, it, it was, I went through that kind of the same thing, like, oh my gosh, since I grew up there, like, did I, what, did I, you know, give something to Jackson? And, you know, from what I understand about pediatric cancer, and this very, I have very little knowledge, but that it seems like it's like a genetic snafu. It's like, you know, one gene kind of just goes crazy. And I mean, I don't, I don't I'm sure that's not across yeah. the board, but it's like, I mean, there's, I don't, I couldn't have done anything differently because as a parent, you want to fix it. You want to help it. And when you can't, and you're watching in your case, you're watching your child suffer. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you, you want to blame somebody you want to blame, blame yourself. You, you want to blame everybody. And then, and like you said, with, with pediatric cancer date, what I've learned is, and it's true, it ain't nothing, it's nothing that we did. Um, they said it just happens and in children, it just happens. Right. Now in adults, they say, if I had cancer, if I caught, no, if I was diagnosed with cancer as an adult, you can almost all, you can almost always trace back to why. Right. It happened like to I me. smoked or I was out in the sun with no sunscreen. Right. Right. Exactly. Your lifestyle, what you were doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. But what do you say to a child who was enough, met a couple who were literally born with cancer. You know, the youngest I ever seen was a month old. Yeah. I seen a, a kid that was a month old born with cancer, oh, leukemia. Gosh. How do you, I just don't even know how you face that every day with your own child, but you're seeing it all around you all, all the time. And I mean, you know, I would, I would talk to my friend Jess. I'm like, you know, I just don't understand how people do this, but it's like, obviously you do it for, you know, the times where you can do it because you see miracles and you see yeah. positive things. But you know, you, I, I also know with some of the other stories I follow, you see sadness over and over again. And, you know, for me, I know too much. I can't turn my head anymore. And it's my opinion that people, they say it's rare. And so and it's something that they can turn their head from if it doesn't affect them. And yes. I feel like it's never going to become more of a priority if people continue to turn their head away from it. And I guarantee you, yes, I could ask anyone on my Facebook page, how many kids do you know with cancer? And they're going to probably say at least a couple. And so it's like, I just don't, I don't understand. Like, what is your opinion about why they call it rare? rare because um you look at how many kids are diagnosed in the united states yearly with cancer they're saying it was what's the average now about four it's about it's about five or six per day or something like that is that knows it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a low number it's a low number so it's rare but it's not a low number to the parent that is sitting in front of the oncologist literally as we're doing this as me you're talking right now there are some parents sitting in the united states 
who just got the news 10 minutes ago, their child has cancer. Right. It's not rare. It's not rare to them anymore. No. And the fact that it's rare, um, a lot of people say that's a justification for the funding of re- for the research funding that adult cancer is, it's, in, it's more pronounced, pronounced, it's in your face. It's, it's out there. So they pour a lot of money into the adult cancers and it's like, well, pediatric cancer is rare. You only get in 4% of this pie. And we're like, no, I'm not, I, I get it. I, I had, I had that discussion with several people who said, you know, who actually said, Hey, it is statistically, it is rare. I'm like, Ugh. I like okay. to say it's not common, Yeah, but it's not rare. It's not rare. I'm like walking to these hospitals, these floors are packed. And I mean, you're yeah. at, this is one hospital. You know what I mean? That's what I think about. Yes. I'm like, this is one hospital and it's busting at the seams. There's hundreds of children's hospitals throughout. So, you know, I just, I, I, you know, I'm always trying to raise awareness about, you know, how important it is to support things like, um, I'm a big supporter of St. Baldrick's because they fund childhood cancer. And, you know, when you think about the fact that parents have to shave their head, they have to have lemonade stands, they have to do these things in order to raise money and they will. And for me, it gives me a sense of purpose, but when I really think about it, it's pretty infuriating because, you know, when a child, um, dies of cancer, they're missing, 60 years of life. You know what I mean? Yes. And I just like want to do my part to raise awareness about the fact that while it is not common, it's not rare. And I just can't continue to spread that, that lie. Cause it's not. Yeah. It's not rare. I mean, here's rare for you. I'll give, I'll give you a rare fact. My son had can't was diagnosed in 2015 has been fighting off and on for six years. Two years ago, in 2019, there was another uh, student in his high school. She was diagnosed with leukemia. So now you got two students in the same high school at the same time with leukemia, fighting the same time. She went on, she went to St. Jude, she did her thing, she's doing great. Now it's Matthew, but just last year, another student at Matthew's high school, a young man, was diagnosed with cancer. He's currently fighting as we speak from the same high school. Wow. And it's like, you're talking almost three years in a row now, that high school is rallying around a student who's right. fighting cancer. Right. You know, three years straight. That's crazy. Yeah. That's, that's not rare. Right. So I want to, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how, how has this affected your family? Oh, wow. Um, it's affected a lot. Um, I think mean, let's see how it affected the siblings. He has two older brothers. They're older, you know, uh, one's in the third, early thirties, one's in the late twenties. They moved away. They're one lives in, uh, Dallas and Texas. Now one lives in Florida, but it affected them because it was their little brother. And it's like, my little brother's going through cancer and, I'm at a, I'm living out of state. I can't even be there for him, you know. Um, it affected my wife. My wife is she's she's a career woman. She's working. I'm retired army. And then looking back on that, it's a blessing. I did 21 years in the army, and I retired in 2011. And Matthew was diagnosed a couple years later, mm. so that was why I was able to stay with him 24 seven. You know, um, not leave his side or whatever. And my wife was working at the time and, you know, she kept her job going and she had support from her job initially through the first, uh, through the first cancers actually. But then when he got hit with Impal, she went back to her work. It's like, Oh, my son was diagnosed with cancer again. We're going to fight because she took FMLA. She took time off from work to be there with us. Their whole attitude had changed. It went from support to, Oh, your child, Literally, she walked in and like, told him, my child was diagnosed today. Um, it looks like I'm going to probably take some time off again to go be with him. And she was told, can't your husband have handle this? Yeah. Uh, that wouldn't go uh, very well with me. 
Yeah. I, honestly, you got to know my wife. <laughs> I was shocked. She That happened that morning. She handled it well. She went back to her desk. She's like, okay. And then she stewed. And by the, time, it, by the end of the day, when she clocked out, she clocked out, went to a supply room and got a box. And they were like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm done. <laughs> nice. Yes. Good uh, for yeah. her. She finished out the day and she went and she packed all her stuff. So I'm done and walked out. But it affected her. She basically had to quit her job to come be with her son. That, that's how it affected her. Right. And I think about, you know, okay, so you have a child with cancer. If you have two parents working, one of them pretty much has to quit to be there with their child. But then thinking about how hard it is for that parent who's working and can't be there with their child. And I like the being how it has affected financially. I can't really even fathom that. You know what I mean? Because of all the, the bills and you know, you're living not at your home. You know, we were talking a little bit before Mm -hmm. we got on about the Ronald McDonald house. Would you talk a little bit about kind of how that's helped your family? And, you know, I think people will sometimes think when they're at McDonald's, you know, I'll round up, but I don't think they really totally realize what all the Ronald McDonald house does. Oh, what does Ronald McDonald house? It, it is a sanctuary, honestly, because when, like the Ronald McDonald House I'm at now, I'm at the Ronald McDonald House in Cincinnati. It is the largest Ronald McDonald House in the world. It got that title a few months ago, actually. That's awesome. When they added on. The largest in the world. And what do they provide? It's a sanctuary. Because when we walk across the street to the hospital, going back to my military background, the second I walk through that door, I'm in full combat mode. I'm here to fight for my kid. Yes. You know, and... I'm here to base. I'm here to fight for my kid. I'm not here to, you know, joke and whatever. And you lay that, st- you lay all that stress on you. It whole, your whole demeanor is let's get my child through this mm-hmm. and get them home. And at the, sometimes at the end of the day, you can run across the street, you walk in, it's like walking into peace. Mm-hmm. Literally. It's like a wait. As soon as you walk through the door, you know, you got the staff, Hey, how's your day? How's Matthew doing today? How are you doing today? You're hungry? Here's some food. You don't even have to pay for it. They're like, here, we're feeding you lunch and dinner. Can we do something for you? Um, they got, like I said, they have outside agencies. They used to, uh, salons come do your haircut. They had masseuse that would come in and give parents a massage if they need it. Just to it alleviate stress. And the stress of, you know, how am I going to pay for a hotel room? How am I going to pay for food? You know, like you said, the bills don't stop just because your kid has cancer. Sometimes it amplifies. <laughs> and I can't imagine paying a mortgage in another state and then you're here paying, a, you know, an $80 a night hotel bill and eating out every day, spending money. So it's a huge weight in the finance. It's a huge financial weight off shoulders of parents here. And it's just a sanctuary. And you're in a building with other parents who know exactly what you're going through. You may not be going through cancer because you got, you got organ transplants, you got kids sick with other things. But the one thing we all have in common is if you're in this house, you're here because your kid is sick with something and you have someone to lean on. Yeah. You know, that's important. You know, it is important. And I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I have with other parents in the hallways. We go into our know, rooms, whatever you stop. We start talking. How's your kid? My kid's doing okay. Your kid's doing okay. How are you doing? They say, I look up 40 minutes has passed. We just talking and then you walk away and it's like, Hey, thanks for talking to me today. You know, I needed that. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's a blessing. And they're not just here in Cincinnati. They're all over the world. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there may be one in a state, wherever you're watching from, there may be one in the state that you're in. Right. And like she's like Kerry said, rounding up, uh, this new thing is rounding up. You can round your order up to make it even and that extra money go towards Ronald McDonald house. Used to be, you can throw your change. I know y'all remember the change at the front of the counters, change are at the drive through Throw your change for Ronald McDonald. I used to throw my change in there all the time yeah. before Matthew's dad knows. Wow. Throwing your change in there Never in a million years thinking you're going to be on the receiving end of that. Never. I never in a million years as I was donating my change thinking one day 
I'm going to be receiving on the receiving end of your kindness or your generosity. And uh, it's a it's, it's a great place. Wow! Real, can't sing his praises enough. That's wonderful. Um, I um, you know, a lot of the focus of this podcast is talking about grief, and mm-hmm. you know that doesn't necessarily mean loss. And so, you know, as a father, um, I'm sure you're grieving often about what your son is going through. Would you be willing to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, grief. I think I told someone, I may even post it once before that, uh, when I was in the army, I served for 21 years involved in two wars, fought in two wars. And, um, I thought I knew what stress was. I was like, that's the ultimate stress of, you know, you waking up that day or going out that night, wondering if you're going to live. You're watching, you know, friends that pass away over there, whatever. And that's stressful. And you grieve. Once I got back and got thrust into this, I was like, the grief, the grieving that I was going through in war was nothing. Absolutely nothing compared to the grieving going through that I was going through watching my son laying in a hospital bed, getting s- smaller by the day. And I say smaller, I'm talking about like the weight loss, or whatever, getting smaller by the day, pumps beeping, you know, 24 hours a day, watching this poison going into him, want, wishing it was me instead. Mm-hmm. You know, wishing it was me laying there, not him. It's stressful to watch your kids fight. It's, it makes you grieve. Mm. I was grieving that he was having to fight. I was grieving that it wasn't me instead, you know. And then you meet these other parents and they lose their child. And you, it's not my child. I, I, I It's not my child, but. To me, it felt like I grieved just as hard as if it was my child. Had some friends from where you're from, you know who they are. Yep. From St. Louis. When they didn't they didn't lose their baby, they didn't lose their child to cancer, but they lost their child. They were here. They were in the Rob McDonald house with us. They were two rooms down from us because, you know, he was going through a bone marrow transplant and all that too for his particular illness. And they lost their child. And me and my wife grieve just as I think we grieve just as hard for them with them as if it would have been if it had been Matthew. Right. You become attached to these families, and it hurts. Yeah. Uh, it 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 hurts. And there's a thing here at the Ronald McDonald House. I'll touch on real quick. They have a lamp that sits up high as you walk into the building. Every every day when I walk into this building, I glance up. Mm. There's a lamp that sits in this window. If that lamp is on. That means a child has passed away. That was their family was staying in this house. Mm. And it is crushing to walk in, look up and see that lamp on when you knew it was off yesterday. Mm. You know, because you know that some family in this building that you're sharing, it's a home. Yeah. This is our home. Right. And we're all in this home together. And that some family in this home has just lost their child. Grief. Mm. It, it hits you. And, um, if you, and if you don't, if you hold it all in, if you try to compartmentalize it and like, I'm a tough it out, if you don't talk about it or talk to someone or get help or get network to another family that's going through, you know, whatever, it will tear you apart. I've seen people, I've seen people up here who lost their child, went home had no support system had nothing and it tore them apart. Literally. I've seen marriages fail yes. after their, their kid has gone through an illness like this or their kids passed away. Yeah. I've seen marriages fail. I've seen people both turn to drinking. I mean, cause it is, they didn't have that outlet. And, um, so yeah, that's what grief is to me is I can, I can talk on this all night is it's painful. It hurts but it helps if you seek help. And that's another thing I want to say is there is absolutely nothing wrong with seeking help. 
Yes. My thing is, my, my, my philosophy is this. One of two things are going to happen if you seek help. You're either going to go seek help, and it's going to do nothing for you, so you're going to leave in the exact same place you walked into. Yeah. Or it's going to help you, and you're going to leave that place better, able to handle, to express your grief, handle your grief, your, uh, your grieving process, whatever it may be, because I'll never, ever, ever, ever put someone down for how they grieve. Yes. How you grieve is, is how you grieve. That's yes. you. Yes. But if you need help, don't, don't be afraid to seek it, please, because it, only one, two things. You're going to need to be the same or you're going to leave better. Yeah. I say it all the time. I would not be where I am doing the things I am, and I still feel sometimes, well, most of the time, like I'm a mess still with help. I don't really don't know how people do it without help and breaking that stigma of it's okay to get help. You know, I mean, I just think to myself, you wouldn't walk around with a broken arm. You would get a cast for it. You would go to the doctor, you, you know, so why do we allow ourselves to go around with a broken heart or, you know, with your, with your emotions messed up. And that was another thing. It was a perfect lead into discussing, um, how you deal with your grief and what has been helpful for you. So if you talk about the Gildas club. Yes. Uh, how do I deal with my grief? Several ways. Um, I start, I, I start Matthew's page and that actually, I didn't know it at the time because I started because the day that he was diagnosed, I went on Facebook and was like, Hey, y'all guys know me. Our son Matthew was diagnosed with cancer. My my Facebook message inbox, I had over two hundred something messages blowing up. Oh, is he okay? How's he doing? What type? And that first night that he was diagnosed, my wife walked in. It was like two o'clock in the morning. She's like, "What are you doing?" And I was sitting there and I was answering each individual message that I got. She's like, "You're gonna be. You can't do that. You're gonna be here all night. Just make a Facebook post." I was like, oh, okay, yes, that sounds like a plan. But I ended up making a page, and I started telling his story through the page, and I I guess in a way it sort of became therapeutic because I wasn't holding anything in. And as I wrote, I promised the people that follow Matthew's page, we call you Team Matthew, and I promised you, if you follow Matthew's page, I will be 100% transparent. I will put the good, the bad, and the ugly about what my son's fighting. I won't leave nothing out. If pictures make you squeamish, I'm sorry. And let you know that the pictures will be there if it's bad. Um, but it, it sort of made, it gave me an outlet. Instead of going to bed each night with watching what he went through that day, good, bad, or ugly, and a lot of times, and a lot of times it was ugly, instead of just dwelling on that, I would go and I would, that night I would make a Facebook up post, you know, update to let you all know what was going on, but also to release it. Yes. To release that grief, that pain I was feeling. And I was basically just sharing it with you all. And thankfully, a lot of people were receptive to it. And they were like, hey, they, I mean, I got people that's been on the page since 2015 and haven't wavered. And you know, I thank them. It's, y- y'all gave me an outlet. And then there was organizations. We, um, the hospitals, you get your social worker, they're good at showing you organizations like, hey, if you, you know, parent groups, uh, one-on-ones, whatever, a lot of it's free. And one of them that was, we were introduced to back in Louisville was Gildas Club. And um, it's, it is phenomenal. Uh, Gildas Club is all over the United States. And in, it was, the name is from Gilda. I wish I could remember her last name. I want to slap myself and not know, remember her last name, but she used to be on Saturday night live in the seventies and eighties. Okay. And she died of cancer and her husband was Gene Wilder. You probably know who he was. Right. Um, what's the name of the show? Well, it's the big one he's known for is Willie Wonka and the chocolate factory. I yep. think who it is. Yep. Big one. yep. That Gene Wilder, that was his wife. And they had started a, a, a non profit organization to help families going through cancer and what does Gilded club offer support groups you know they do like weekly support groups and monthly networking groups whatever where you can go in there and you can do a you know 
they may have it. You may have lost a child or lost a family member. You can be in that group or your, 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 your child or our family members currently in treatment. You can be in that support group, you know, once a week. And we started going there, they would feed you. Then we go into these rooms and talk and listen and cry. Well, I'm not a crier. <laughs> I'm not a crier. Well, you see, you see, you know, you see grown men in there breaking down, talking about what their, what their child's going through or what their wife that they've been with forever is now fighting cancer. It was, it was great. And they also offer education, uh, cancer related workshops, give you all this information that you need or resources, you know, for financial aid or, you know, the information your, your child or spouse has cancer or whatever. They also do um, healthy lifestyle, which is like nutrition. They do exercise like yoga, wow. stuff like that. It's so expressive arts, all free. Wow. And then, and then not only, is, not only is it offered for adults, it's also for kids, siblings. Because when a child gets cancer, especially if they have younger siblings or even a little older siblings, it affects those siblings too. Because you get, I'm sure some of you have kids out there, you love all your kids equally. You, you shower them all with attention. But then when one of your kids gets cancer, that is a attention I call it attention thief. Mm -hmm. You are so focused on, I got to, you know, I want my child to survive, to beat this thing. And then you look over and, you, and the siblings are like, you see them, they, you can see in their eyes, like they feel left out. Like, Hey, I'm still here. I still love, you know, I love you, mom, dad. I still need your love and support. And it's not, and, you know, so they have, they have activities, workshops, stuff for the siblings. Um, it's just a, it's just a great it's just a great organization and it's all free it's free and the thing their their slogan is like there's a there's like I told you earlier there's a builders club in St Louis and their slogan is community is stronger than cancer that's their slogan that's wonderful and yeah and it goes in it you know it said it goes in to say that all are welcome the club is for everyone. Those fighting cancers, those caring for those fighting cancers are those who love those who are fighting cancer. And, um, and they say it's free. I'm reading it right now. Yeah. No matter how cancer has entered your life, no matter where you are in the journey, you'll find the support you need at Gilda's Club for free. Because the last thing someone dealing with cancer needs is another expense. Yes. All are welcome. All are welcome. Yes. And we started going to Gilda's Club. And it was, a, it was huge. Um, me and my wife, we, and we were able to meet other parents, you know, who were years ahead of us in treatment and they were able to offer us what they were doing to get through it are, Hey, your kid has this cancer. My, so did mine. Um, next time this happens, bring this up. It helped us. You know, it was the information and the support and the release of take a breather is is i can't champion that enough well that's wonderful and i was super happy to learn about that because i did not know about that previously um honestly i could literally talk to you for probably a couple more hours but the one last point i really would like to talk about is um would you share how many blood transfusions that matthew has had as well as the importance of donating blood and blood products during a time when there is a critical shortage. Yes, absolutely. Um, the question you get a lot from people is how can I help? Um, but they don't live here. They're, they may live in another state. They may be on the other side of the world or whatever. It's like, I feel helpless. How can I help? Can I buy a t-shirt? Can I do this? One thing you can do is donate blood or plasma. Yes. Um, you you donate blood or plasma. You, one, if Carrie, you go in, you donate, right, and you leave. That one bag you donate can save up to four lives, four different lives. And Matthew um, has been fighting for six, off and on for six years, and he's had, as of today, he's had four hundred and seventy-two blood transfusions, blood and platelet transfusions in the past six years. Four hundred and seventy-two. 
that's 472 people who don't, some of them may know Matthew, but many don't. They just walked in and gave blood somewhere and their, their product ended up in Matthew. You just gave Matthew the, a chance to live to fight another day because cancer wreaks havoc on hemoglobin and platelets. The chemo, let me, let me go back, the chemo and radiation also wreaks havoc, you know, the treatment itself. And blood and platelet like transfusions are huge. And when, since we had the pandemic, a lot of people stayed home last year. Everybody was shut in. And now that we're in 2021, yes, the pandemic isn't over, but everything that closed down last year is catching up to us. There's critical blood shortages all over the United States. You know, um, I'm at Cincinnati Children's. They get their blood and products from Hawksworth right up the street, right up the street. And there's been a couple of times where he needed, you know, platelets and they're like, it's going to normally it takes like 30 minutes and it's here wow. and they're ready to give. And then I'm like, okay, he needs platelets today. It's taking him four or five hours to get it. And then you're like, what's going on? It's like, well, there's a critical shortage. So, uh, we have to get it. We have to go farther out to get it. We're hitting up other hospitals. We're hitting up all the blood banks, see if they got it. And then I, I donate regularly now. So I get the text that will they'll tell us that there's a critical shortage of platelets in your region right now, or it's a critical shortage of AB positive. Can you donate? It, donating blood is one way you can help. Um, you're, you're, you're literally saving lives. And yeah, it may not go into a cancer patient. Right. It can go into an accident victim. It can go into a burn patient. It can go into a, a woman who's lost, who's losing blood during her, her birth, when she's giving birth to a child or whatever, maybe she has a hemorrhage. Right. You're, 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 you're saving people. When you sit in that chair for literally an hour at the most, sometimes, right. sometimes less, you walk away just know that 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 what you just did, you you just saved up to four people's lives, and that you are giving my son a chance, yes. and these kids up here a chance to fight another day, because losing a child and watching a child die of cancer period, is, well, die period is is heartbreaking and sad. A lot of times, it's not the cancer that takes them. You know, right. it's not the cancer. It's it, sometimes it's the treatment that takes them. Right. Sometimes it's the side effects to where now they can't make hemoglobin and no matter how much you give them, you know, it doesn't work. But they say you donating, you're helping. You're, you're, my son is here today because of 472 transfusions. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, um, six years. I have always um, been a big advocate for it. Uh, but then after Jackson died, um, I started thinking more about the childhood cancer avenue. And then my husband um, had a blood infection and he needed nine blood transfusions in six weeks. And without that, because his body wasn't making enough blood, mm -hmm. he very likely could have died. I mean, he could have died under many circumstances that with his recent illness that he had. And so we, every time we host a blood drive, I think about... And I share that I know a person who has received 472 blood transfusions, and that's one person. One person. You know, I mean, think about the millions of people that need the blood transfusion. So it's like, I just cannot drive that point home enough. It is so important. It's even more important now because less people are donating and more people need it. And mm -hmm. so... Actually, we're having a blood uh, drive on October 25th, which may be after we share this. But um, <laughs> I um, I knew that this was going to be a wonderful, very rich conversation, and it really has been. And um, I'm fully invested in Matthew's story, and um, I'm Thank thankful you. that you share um, as much as you do because it absolutely profoundly affects people. And you're doing wonderful things with how you bring so much awareness to it. It's a hard job, but you do you do it so well. And I'm just so thankful. Thank and you. I know that today someone is going to learn something that they didn't know. And the way I'm wrapping up every episode is we're all just walking each other home. 
And, you know, I feel that, you know, there, there's a lot of darkness in this world, but when you choose to, to see the light, you really can. And, you know, that's what I want to do with this podcast is to share a little hope and, you know, you just don't know sometimes how many people that you're affecting. So I'm, I'm very, very thankful that you joined me today. No, uh, thank you. Uh, no, thank you so much for having me. Um, I would love to come back anytime. I can, say I can talk on this for hours. Oh yeah. I can touch different subjects for hours and uh, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. Like you said, you're raising awareness daily, your, your podcast going out and, you know, the first time I got, the first time I met you, well, knew of you was through Jess. Mm-hmm. She said, Hey, I got a friend going through. Next I know I got this calendar in the mail. I'm like, who is this kid? Oh, oh. and I read the story. It was heartbreaking. I and forgot about the calendar. Yes. We got the calendar oh. and a uh, red Jackson story. And we, I put the calendar up and we went through it. And uh, that's how I first learned of you. And oh. you, you, you're, you're doing, you're doing the Lord's work. Um, you, you are, and I can't thank you enough. And I know Jackson has to be proud of his mama. Thank you. I he, hope he, so. Uh, I know so. You, you're, you're doing it. Awesome. You have found, you are a fierce advocate, and we're thankful to have you in our corner. Thank you so much.